Straight Talk from Israel. You're listening to Israel News Talk Radio. Welcome, everybody, to Israel Unplugged. We have a special show for you today. Uh, it's special in many ways. First of all, it's Yom Yerushalayim, a very special day for the Jewish people, especially for us here in Israel. And even though I am broadcasting to you from a Beit Shemesh, Israel, uh, I was in Yerushalayim, Jerusalem, this morning, and... I could say that my heart is always in Jerusalem, as are the hearts of all of the Jewish people. So we're going to have a special show for you today. I'm going to be doing it myself today. Josh is uh, Josh Wander, the main host of the show, is uh, in Jerusalem actually today, and he's not able to join us. Maybe we'll we'll speak to him for a minute or two. Um, I just want to remind you that. Israel Unplugged, we bring you the unadulterated facts of where we're holding in the redemptive process, focusing primarily on the ingathering of the exiles. No spin, no twist, just facts on the ground. And that is for sure what we're going to discuss today, because we we have a lot to talk about, about Yom Yushalayim. That was another phase in the redemptive process a very important part of the redemption, um, and we're going to discuss that at length. So uh, just to remind you, um, we are a live show, and therefore you can call in. If you are in North America, the phone number is 301-768-4841. That's 301-768-4841. And if you are lucky enough to be... um, to really have the privilege to be living in God's special land. So our number here is 0265001510 0265001510. Also to remind you that we have websites that are very uh, worthwhile looking into. There's mine, that's torahzion.com, where my books, you can find my books. And Josh has a website called bringthemhome.org, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, where there's fantastic videos about um, about uh, making Aliyah. So stay with us. We'll be right back after the break. Israel is located in one of the most volatile areas in the world. Israel is an island of stability and a sea of war and unrest. In the midst of this turmoil, Israel stands out as a beacon of order and human progress. Each week we update you on what's happening in this, the Jewish state, a true light unto the nations. This is Jay Shapiro. Join me every Thursday on Israel News Talk Radio. Welcome back, everybody, to Israel Unplugged. And as I promised, we're going to be speaking about today the great, unbelievable day that we are celebrating today called Yom Yerushalayim, or Jerusalem Day. It's the day 54 years ago we regained uh, control over Jerusalem, the holy city, the eternal capital of the Jewish people. Um, You know, I mean, the events were so unbelievable and so miraculous and i'm not talking about miracles that are you know beyond nature supernatural miracles no that's not what happened but you know we believe that uh, god's hand is involved in the history of the jewish people and when things that are so blatantly you know guided by the hand of god we call that miracle yeah, that's also called a miracle. I mean, you know, we call the the Purim story a miracle, uh, and there was no supernatural miracle there either. And here, it w- there was definitely more closer to supernatural miracles in the Six Day War than there were on the in the Purim story. So anyway, 
you know, I'm sure that the listeners are well aware of the events that happened here 54 years ago. Either you've read a good book about it um, or recently many, many really good movies, videos have been put out by various organizations, by, by the Mizrahi and by others uh, about the Six Day War, and like really short, you know, five minute, maximum ten minute videos that describe what happened during the war. I want to read for you just one uh, such um, uh, uh, testimony of what happened during the war from a rabbi named Rabbi Eliyahu Kitov. He wrote a very important book called The Book of Our Heritage. It's a book about uh, the Jewish calendar. It goes through the entire Jewish year, and whenever there's a special day, he, um, he, he discusses it and discusses it uh, from a Jewish perspective, from Jewish sources, uh, from Midrashim, from Gemaras, Talmud, everything. He really, really thoroughly discusses all of the different, um, the different aspects of the holiday. And it's very interesting because in the Hebrew edition, there is nothing, absolutely nothing, about Hey Er, the 5th of Er, which is Jew, uh, Israeli Independence Day, or Yom Yerushalayim, today, Chav Chet Er, Jerusalem Day. And, um, but if you but, there's an English translation of the book, and in that one, there is a whole discussion in both of those days about the events that took place. And he writes in another work, he writes that the reason why it's not in the Hebrew is because he was convinced by, by certain people not to put it in so that people wouldn't, uh, wouldn't sort of you know, put him in cheyrim, how do you say that, excommunicate him, or, or refuse to buy the book because, you know, God forbid, it talks about, it, it discusses. By the way, he doesn't say clearly that uh, you know, we should necessarily have a new holiday, etc., but he discusses the issues and he, so he gives the, the good and the bad, the positive and the negative. So anyway, the fact is the fact, and it is in the English edition, and I want to read for you what he writes. He says, on the 26th of Iyar, which is two days ago, there had stood surrounding the borders of Israel all the armies of Egypt, Jordan, Syria, and Iraq, which then had nearly 200,000 troops supplied by Russia with an arsenal of mighty weapons. In the ears of the whole world, they arrogantly declared we are set upon destroying the Jewish state and murdering its inhabitants. They will have no escape. Now, you have to understand, you know, today I think people are a little bit uh, shy away from. I mean, OK, it's true that Iran uh, unabashedly calls for the destruction of, uh, of the entire state of Israel. But there are, there are less people today who would say it so strongly and so outright. Um, in those days, 54 years ago, the entire Arab, Arab world believed it and hoped for it and said it explicitly. It wasn't like it was, it was uh, hidden. It, their agenda wasn't hidden. It was clear as day. Nasser, the, um, the, the leader of, of Egypt, said, we are going to push the Jews into the sea and destroy them. But, says Rav Eliyahu Kitov, this was not to be. The army of Israel, though greatly outnumbered, destroyed the besieging armies and seized vast stretches of enemy-held territory. And then he says, it was a clear act of God that drove the troops of the kingdom of Transjordan into a war of madness. You see, Jordan was not really involved in the war. Um... But they were tricked by the Egyptians into entering the war, and they started shelling Jerusalem, the other side of Jerusalem, West Jerusalem, and therefore we had to, as self-defense, we had to fight, and that's how we got. That's how we got Jerusalem. It was an act of God which restored to the children of Israel the cities of the lands of Yehuda and Shomron, Judea and Samaria, and the holy city Jerusalem. And now he says the following. The wondrous deliverance on the 28th of Iyar, the day of Jerusalem, and the days following, transcends by far in scope and character many other historic events which gained a unique standing in the Jewish calendar. I Meaning there are some events in the Jewish calendar that we celebrate 
which don't even come close to what happened during Jerusalem Day. And and you have to understand that this Rabbi El Kitov was squarely in the Haredi world, in the ultra-Orthodox uh, Jewish world, usually understood to be either anti-Zionist or at best non-Zionist. And on the way, and nonetheless, you can't deny that the events that happened here were were of biblical proportions, literally of biblical proportions. These are things you read, read about in the Bible. You know that God destroyed all the enemies of Israel. You know in one night, and and it's all over. And that's what happened here. It's really, it's really unbelievable. And then he says, all acknowledge the fact that the Jews in Israel emerged from the shadow of death to a new and vibrant life. So those are the facts. So the question is, how do we react to it? Or how did certain people react to it? So, so in reality, most of the Jewish world, and really the vast majority, I would say even 99%, and I'm talking about not only Zionists, not secular Zionists, not only secular Zionists, religious Zionists, um, even Haredi ultra-Orthodox Jews realize that something very special happened to you. Because you have to remember, besides the fact that Jewish lives were saved, because as I mentioned before, Nasser wanted to destroy the, all the Jewish people, not only kick them out of the land, but kill them. So it was it was a potential holocaust. Everyone was talking about the fact that it's going to be another holocaust. And we were saved. You know, it's unbelievable to think about it. And besides that, we also gained control over the holy places which we were not allowed to pray in. We weren't allowed to go to the Kotel, to the Western Wall, to Kever Rachel, which was uh, Rachel's tome and many other holy holy sites for the Jewish people. And now we were able to. So even religious Jews, ultra-Orthodox Jews, recognize the uniqueness, the specialness of this event. Um, the, there's, there's one, uh, I have a quote here from one Hasidic Rebbe named the Slonim Rebbe, Rav Shalom Noach Barzavsky, who says that... Um, explicit, clear miracles and a, a, a um, how would you say this in English, a harat panim, the God shone, shined his face upon us, upon the Jewish people. And these are events that we have not been privileged to see for tens of decades. I, we would say it in English, dozens of, of decades, not decades, I'm sorry, dozens of generations, generations, meaning thousands of years. And therefore, we are not allowed to be uh, ingrates. We can't possibly uh, just go about our business and say, you know, oh, what does that have to do with me? You know, it was very nice. And that's it. You know, it still it was done by secular Jews. It still is not exactly the way we would have expected and hoped for it to happen. All the rabbis, except for, we could say, except for one. There was one rabbi who came out and even wrote a whole book about it afterwards, claiming that there was nothing miraculous in this war. There was absolutely, it was just a very, very well-planned and, um, you know, well-executed uh, war effort. And that's it. And he then says, and even if there would be miracles, we don't believe God cannot do miracles. He actually says those words. God's can, God cannot do miracles for the wicked. And therefore, he claims that it was done by Satan. But we, of course, the vast majority of even ultra-Orthodox Jews uh, and rabbis did not agree with him on this. They, in fact, strongly disagreed with him on this. And they all gave thanks to God for the miracles that happened. Unfortunately, over the years, uh, people are turning more to the right and they are becoming more and more extreme and not even doing anything on this day, not, not saying any kind of praise to God for the miracles that he did because we're still enjoying the miracles. It's not like, you know, it was a one-time thing. We can go to the Kotel at any day, any day in the middle of the day, you feel like you want to talk to God, you go to the Kotel. We could only do that because of what happened 54 years ago. We only have Yudav Shomron, the hundreds of thousands of Jews living in Judea and some Samaria because of the Six-Day War. There is so much that we gained during that war, and we have to say thank you to God. 
I'll just end this section with the following. You know, the, the Gemara says that his Chizkiyahu was the king in biblical times. He was supposed to be the Messiah. And the reason he wasn't the Messiah is because he didn't give thanks to God when God brought him an amazing, miraculous victory. And we don't want to repeat that mistake. It's, it, it is a terrible thing not to thank God for the miracles that he does for us. Okay, so stay with us and we'll continue this discussion right after the break. The Tamar Yona Show. Tamar, she's sassy. She's smart. She's funny. But she's also a real Jewish mother. Hi, everybody. I'm Tamar Yona. And yes, I can be all of those things. But at Israel News Talk Radio, I'm here to bring you the news stories and guests that you may not hear anywhere else. Join me live on air Sundays, Mondays, and Tuesdays for the most unique and bold talk radio in Israel. The Tamar Yona Show. Shalom, I'm Leah Aharoni. Join me on my show, News from the Torah. Each Sunday, we'll use the weekly Torah portion as a prism for understanding the news today. Listen to News from the Torah to gain clarity about the times we're living in and to understand your own spiritual path in the process. News from the Torah, every Sunday on Israel News Talk Radio. Welcome back to Israel Unplugged, and we're talking about the special day that we find ourselves on, the Jerusalem Day, Yom Yerushalayim, 28th day of ER. And we were talking about the fact that there are some people who unfortunately, and in the beginning it was a very small minority, and unfortunately it has started to grow, uh, and, and there are many people just Go about their business as if nothing happened, as if there's nothing special to say thank you to God for today on a day like today. So the question I want to ask is why? Why is this so? What makes people so blind to what what's happening? Um, you know, the, the real answer, of course, is because it's not exactly perfect. It's not exactly the way they expected it to be. I want to I want to share with you a beautiful idea on this that I saw that uh, I once received in my inbox by Rabbi David Ebner. Okay, he's a he's a Rosh yeshiva head of the yeshiva called Eretz Atzvi in Jerusalem, and you know there's a famous Talmudic statement where the the Talmud asks, why did Moshe Moshe Rabbeinu tell Pharaoh? that the death of the firstborns would take place about, at about midnight. Why didn't he say it will happen at midnight? Exactly, because we know, you know if Moses, as Moses said it's going to happen at midnight, that means that's what God told him, that it's going to be exactly at midnight. So the Talmud answers and says that it's because maybe Paro's, Pharaoh's wise men would make a mistake in their reckoning of the time of day, and they would say Moshe is a liar. So, so Rabbi Ebner says, this is just so ridiculous. This seems to fly in the face of all reasonable thought. After all, Moshe had correctly predicted nine terrible and unusual events that had literally plagued the Egyptian people. He then predicted the most terrible of all, that there's going to be the death of all of the firstborn in Egypt. And let's say, theoretically, he would have said it's going to happen at midnight, right? And let's say it happens one minute past midnight, according to the clocks of the of the elders of Pharaoh, right? Can you imagine? They're going to say, oh, you see, Moshe's a liar. Even though we got 99% of everything correct, and, and, and it's still happening. It's just happening a little late. They're going to say that, oh, he, he got it wrong. He's a liar. What this teaches us is that people don't like unpleasant truths. They simply, they will, they will grab at the thinnest of straws to deny the reality which stares them in the face. And that's what's happening here. Same idea. 
they they don't like it. It doesn't fit into their their interpretation of the way they expected things to happen, and therefore they claim that there's nothing special, nothing unique happened here. So that's one idea. Um, there there are, there's another beautiful idea that I saw in a book called Hatkufa Gdola, called the Great Era, um, and it's an idea by Rabbi Shimon Schwab who quoted the Chavitz Chaim. And for those of you who don't know, the Chavitz Chaim was the unparalleled, uh, universally accepted greatest rabbi of his time, um, which is he lived from around uh, 18, the 1830s to 1935. Okay, he died in 1935. And he says as follows. We know that in the Bible, it talks about that the, in the, when the Jews were in the desert, they ate the manna, right? The man. That was their food. They got food from heaven. And we also know that there's a very famous idea that the, man, the manna, the man, man, would taste like anything you wanted it to take, taste like. If you would think of a, you know, a delicious burger, that's what it would taste, about, taste like. If you would think of a pizza pie, that's what it would taste like. So he asks and says, and what would happen? What would happen if you didn't think of anything when you were eating it? You just put it in your mouth and didn't think of any other food. So, of course, says the Chafetz Chaim, that it wouldn't taste heavenly or special at all. And that's a rule. The rule is that... <clears throat> That in order for one to appreciate something metaphysical, one has to contemplate it. One has to give thought to what he is doing. And therefore, if he doesn't, he's not going to see anything special in it. And it's true about everything. It's true about Torah study, which is so special and so beautiful and so sweet. But there are plenty of people who don't find it sweet. And that's because they don't contemplate. They don't think about it. They don't really appreciate what they're doing. And then the Chafetz Chaim says... The same thing is true about the advent of the Messiah. At that time, he writes, God will reveal his Shekhinah, which means his divine presence, to the entire world. But only those who contemplate the historical processes unfolding before their very eyes will sense the extraordinary nature of the times in which they live. He who does not reflect upon the coming of the Messiah will not feel anything at all. And that, unfortunately, is one of the reasons why there are people out there today who could see a miracle like the miracles that were done 54 years ago on Jerusalem Day and not be really excited, not re be really moved because they're not really contemplating, they're not really thinking in terms of Messiah, in terms of the Messianic era, because according to them, it's not, it's it's not happening the way they expected it to happen. It's this is not it. This can't be it, because it's being done through secular Jews, because of all the problems that there are, and we we all, we all acknowledge that there are problems, that there are uh, that things aren't perfect. We all know that, but that doesn't change the fact. Like Rabbi Ebner said, you can't have not, so much of it co correct. You know, 99% everything comes co co is the way it's supposed to be. But there's one little part that didn't work out exactly, so you're going to deny the whole thing. It doesn't make any sense. And we have to give thanks to God for this tremendous, tremendous miracle that he did for us. There's another idea which I – which um also illustrates this this point, and it, it's something. It's a story that happened with Rabbi Cook, Rav Avram Yitzchak Cohen Cook, who was the first chief rabbi of uh, Mandate Palestine of Israel. Um, in 1920, we all know that there was a conference in San Remo, Italy. It was the League of Nations got together and they basically granted the British Empire a mandate over Palestine, which in effect what they were doing is they were ratifying the Balfour Declaration, which had happened in 1917. So many Jews viewed the San Remo Conference and decision as a very significant and promising event. And 
So when word came out about it, the Jews of the, of the holy city of Jerusalem organized a formal gathering at the Chorva Synagogue. You know, the Chorva Synagogue was recently rebuilt. It was destroyed by the Arabs after uh, when they took over, when they conquered it in 1948, um, 19 years before the, event that we're ta- the events that we're talking about. In a time where feelings have become fact, where rational thought and common sense has disappeared, one man stands above it all. I'm Howie Sobaker, your political hitman. Political Hitman airs every Tuesday at 11.59 p.m. North American time, 7 a.m. Israeli time, only on Israel News Talk Radio. Are you interested in transforming your life, drawing closer to the Creator, and uncovering the deeper meanings and hidden treasures in the Hebrew Bible? Then join me, Rav Yitzhak Michelson, and me, William Hall, on the Science of Kabbalah, where we are seeking to narrow the gap between what we understand of our physical and spiritual worlds. So make sure to tune in every Tuesday at 5 p.m. Israel Time, 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, here on Israel News Talk Radio. Everybody, we had some technical difficulty. I'm sorry about that, um, but we're going to continue where we were. So we, we basically said that those who do not recognize the special, unique character of this day are unfortunately probably blinded by, by uh, peripherals, uh, by small aspects of the redemptive process that's happening, things that do not exactly fit their redemptive clocks, uh, work out to the way they want it to work out. So therefore, they deny it. And that's a very, very terrible sin. We cannot deny thanking God for what he has done here. So now I want to move over and talk about what does this really all mean for us? Besides the fact that, of course, we should all recognize God's hand and give thanks to him, certainly on days like today, on days like the Yom Atzmaut, Israel Independence Day, and, of course, uh, Jerusalem Day today. But I think there's much, much more than that. I think that it, it also is all about what does it mean to give thanks to God? What does it mean? What does it mean to give thanks to anybody? If somebody gave me a beautiful gift or, or whatever, it doesn't matter beautiful or not, somebody gave me a gift, right? And I'm not really so interested in that gift. It doesn't really do anything for me. So I say to them, oh, thank you so much for the beautiful gift you gave me. It's really nice. I'm really going to use it, etc. And then as soon as the person leaves the door, leaves your, your room, you throw it in the garbage. And let's say that person peeks back and sees you doing that, aren't you going to feel terrible? Because your words of thanks were all just lip lip service. And that is parallel to those people who, even if they do recognize the special unique character of this day, but they continue to lead their lives, to live their lives as before, as if nothing really has changed. Well, the only thing that's changed is that I'm going to celebrate an extra holiday or an extra holiday or two. I'm going to say a halal. I'm going to say the words of praise uh, to God on Israel Independence Day, on Jerusalem Day. And I'm going to really thank God for for what he did for us. But when it comes down to it, what does that mean if you don't really show God that you really truly appreciate the gift that he gave him? And don't throw it in the garbage. Don't just neglect it and, and reject it. To reject a gift that God has given us is in effect saying to him, I don't really appreciate it. Because if you would appreciate it, you would take it. If you would really understand the opportunity that God has given us in our day and age to to live in his eternal homeland, in our eternal homeland, that he gave to us as a gift. He gave to Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, our forefathers. He gave it to them to give to his children forever. And we finally, after 2,000 years of of exile, we are able to live normally, beautiful lives, not even such difficult lives, 
maybe a tiny bit harder than some other places in the world. But but we have we have come so far. We're one of the leading economies in the world. People in Israel are not suffering anymore. It's it's not it's not difficult. It's not that difficult to live in Israel anymore. And if we don't actually take uh, to take this gift that God has given us, especially Jerusalem. You can live in Jerusalem, and besides that, you can live throughout Judea and Samaria, the heartland of the Jewish people, um, and you can live there, and you can thrive there, and you can visit the holy sites, and you can pray to God at the Kotel Amaravi, the Western Wall, which, by the way, <laughs> the Midrash tells us that even a person, that, 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 that when a person prays to God, at the Western Wall, that's really the gates of heaven. That is where the gates of heaven are. So all of our prayers go from all over the world to this one place to go up to heaven. There's no other place where where our prayers ascend heavenward. It's only at the, it's actually not at the, not even at the Western Wall. It's at the Harabite. It's what's right beyond the Western Wall, the, uh, the Temple Mount. But, but we finally have an opportunity to get as close as possible and and we don't actually take that opportunity it's in effect us saying to god we don't really appreciate the gift that you gave us and this is a very uh a, a very serious matter it really is and i think that people really have to try to think about it and contemplate it and and as long as people give excuses and try to say that nothing really special happened here 54 years ago or 73 years ago that People are just going to ignore it. They're going to ignore the whole redemptive process that is unfolding before our very eyes. There's another very beautiful idea that I saw uh, also happens to be in the name of the Chafetz Chaim, Rabbi Yisrael Meir Kagan. As I said before, one of the greatest rabbis of in the last 200 years. Um, and he says... Uh, he gave a parable as follows. He said that um, there was once a poor man who was walking in the street and he meets a very wealthy man and he says to him, he starts giving him a whole a whole speech how he's in such dire straits and he doesn't have money to pay for food and he can't pay his rent and he can't pay his bills and he really needs help. Can he please help? So the rich man is really touched and moved by by this poor man's words and therefore he says to him listen i don't have any money on me right now come to my office tomorrow here's the address come to my office tomorrow and i'll write you a nice check the next day comes and the poor man doesn't show up just doesn't show up so i guess the rich man thought okay maybe something happened he couldn't make it okay <clears throat> waited another day or two and again they meet in the street and the poor man goes through the, st the same sob story. I need money. I can't pay my bills. I I'm in dire straits, et cetera, et cetera. So the rich man was really a little confused, but he says, okay, you know what? I don't know. Maybe he had a hard day. So, okay. He said it to him again, listen, I don't have money on me right now, but if you come to my office tomorrow and here's the address, I will give you a nice check. So they, they, they part from each other again, and again, a day or two goes by, and the guy doesn't show up. And finally, on the third, the third time, uh, they meet in the street, and the poor man starts again his whole, you know, his whole speech. And the rich man says to him, he says, I don't understand. Are, do you really mean what you say? I'm telling you that it, all you have to do is come to my office, and I'll help you. Why are you not taking that help that I am willing to give you? Said the Chafetz Chaim, the same thing is true. He actually applies it to a different issue, to the issue of, of Torah study. That, you know, Torah study can be very difficult and one needs heavenly assistance in order to really understand Torah properly. And we actually say that in our prayers every day. Please give us wisdom to be able to understand and uh, fully, deeply understand the, your, your beautiful Torah. Right? And what happens? A person says that during his prayers. And then right after prayers, he runs out of uh, synagogue and he goes right to his business or he eats breakfast and then goes straight, straight to business. And he doesn't open up a book to, to learn Torah the entire day. 
basically God is saying to him, after he prays for him to give him wisdom, God says, sure, you know what, I'll help you out. All you have to do is open a book. Open a book and start learning, and I will show you. I will show you the beauty of Torah, and I will help you understand Torah. And a day goes by, and two days go by. Eventually, Hashem, God, says to us, do you really mean what you say? <laughs> is there any meaning? Is there any depth to what you're saying? You're just, you're just giving me lip service. You don't really mean what you say. So Rav Chaim Drukman, one of the great rabbis of the religious Zionist world, he applies this same idea to the whole issue that we're talking about, the state of Israel, Jerusalem, the land of Israel, the opportunity to live in the land. We pray day in and day out for, for the opportunity to come back to Jerusalem. And after a while, God's going to say, like, do you really mean what you're saying? Because basically God's saying, I've given you the opportunity. Just buy a ticket and get on a plane and come to Israel. And, and yeah, I finally have given you Jews of this generation the opportunity to come back to Israel and to, and to live here. Why are you continuing saying the prayers and not actually following up on, uh, on them and, and, and taking the opportunity that I've given you? It reminds me also of something I— I actually, when I was driving today in my car, I heard a song that that brought me back many years. There's a certain singer, I won't say his name, that uh, is a very beautiful voice. He's actually the son of one of the greatest Jewish singers of, of all time. And he has this song called Home. Home, H-O-M-E. Home, I just want to go home to the city of gold, to Jerusalem, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. I remember many, many, many years ago when I heard that song for the first time on the radio, I went bonkers. I could not believe that here's a Jew in America singing this song and as if like, God, please bring us home to Jerusalem. Bring us home to, to the land of Israel. And I was sitting in the car with my with my young daughter. I don't remember exactly how old. She, this is actually a daughter who just had a baby, her second child, Baruch Hashem, thank God. Anyway. I, I just like in the car, I said, I can't believe the song. And, and I said to my daughter, I said, what's wrong with this song? She said, he, she said why doesn't he just come home? <laughs> what is he singing and praying? And it's a beautiful song, by the way. I heard it again today in the because today, Jerusalem Day, they play all these Jerusalem songs. So so I heard this song again, and it's unbelievable. This person probably still lives outside the land of Israel, but God has answered his prayers, his beautiful song, and he's given him Jerusalem. He's given him the land of Israel. He's given the land of Israel and Jerusalem to all the Jews in the world. All we have to do is pick up and come. And if we don't do so, our thanks to Hashem is basically lip service. So please, please take the message and come home. We need you here to bring about the final stages of the redemption. Thank you for being with us today, and we'll see you next week. Where can you get the inside news on Israel? At Israel News Talk Radio, we're dedicated to sharing Israel's inside story with the world by providing our listeners with news on Israeli politics, current affairs, and Israeli Jewish culture. The Israel News Talk Radio homepage also provides you, the listener, with useful information at your fingertips with scrolling news headlines, weather, currency exchange, Shabbat candle lighting times, and so much more. Our radio programming is always accessible and on demand. We operate absolutely free of charge for everyone, everywhere. If you love what we do, partner with us now by becoming an Israel News Talk Radio supporter. With your support, you'll be inscribed on our Israel News Talk Radio Wall of Fame. There's nothing like us in the world. Be part of something great. Israel News Talk Radio. Straight talk from Israel. Howdy, this is Rita from Leak City, Texas, now living in Israel. And though my heart may have belonged to Texas, it now belongs to Israel and all the fantastic show hosts at Israel News Talk Radio. Hi, this is Michael Solomon from Kiryat Arba, Israel. And why do I love listening to Israel News Talk Radio? Because I love listening to the interesting interviews they do and their news reporting that most other media sources don't cover. Hey, this is Nicole Eko from Malmo, Sweden. It gets pretty cold here in Sweden, so I love cuddling up with a warm cup of tea while I listen to Israel News Talk Radio. 
Hey everybody, this is Frank Morris from Tennessee. Me and my dog Buster really love listening to Israel News Talk Radio. <laughs> You're listening to Israel News Talk Radio. News, opinion, and more. You're listening to Israel News Talk Radio. 